Let's get on with creativity. Let me tell you the reason. So this is a sort of book talk and this story fits, you're absolutely right, interdisciplinarity is my life. Uh, um, I've always hated divisions, I've always suspected them as, as being artificial um, and you know, briefly I was a, a, a Chancellor for Research at Durham and I, it, what I enjoyed there very much was much more exploring bridges between between disciplines than necessarily you know, working with the disciplines themselves, who am I to do that? But I have to say that after working in interdisciplinary thinking and projects for years and years, just please keep eating the crisps. I mean, I, no one, uh, it, it won't, I'm sure the sound system will not pick up the odd crunch and I won't be. So pro providing you bring a few down here for me, I don't mind at all. Uh, but I have to say, I've changed my metaphor for interdisciplinary, oh that's so kind, I've changed my, <laughs> now th this will be picked up by the sound system, I've changed my metaphor for, I didn't want you to say that seriously, go on, send it these people, send it around, quick, don't do this. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's bad, isn't it? Not working well. For interdisciplinarity, I used to think of it as building superstructures across the islands, between these separated islands of our disciplines. Lovely bridges, lovely roads, but after working in between physics and chemistry, then physics and chemical engineering, then physics and biology, then physics and history and theology and, um, and, hist and, and English and literature, I, I've, I've changed my view on this. I think the metaphor is entirely wrong because when we get to the heart of what we know and love about our disciplines, our scholarship, our studies, our knowledge, um, I find that when we explore these spaces between us, rather than building bridges between us, I think we're digging down to a common foundational core. It's much more like these islands are on a planet and the digger we deep, the closer we come together. And it's discovering the innate unity of knowledge and scholarship that we have artificially split up rather than, um, rather than as it were, sticking plaster, sup literally superficial, idea of bridging between disciplines. I wasn't in pl uh, uh, planning on, on saying something so deep just to start with, but it must have been the introduction that got me. Now, let's get on with this. So that is why I find it, let's for those people this side, let's see if we can do this as well. Um, uh, so one of the great, one of the things I enjoy most about being an academic is actually getting out of the university and visiting schools. Um, I've uh, very much enjoyed particularly visiting sixth forms because, you know, it, uh, for, for, independent, for independent study days, for example, you know, something on faith and, and like religions, like you mentioned, I'm in, interested in that. That will never go away. They love that. Of course they do. But art and science, science history. And then, and then uh, I, I, I'll sometimes ask, well, what are you studying? And some of them will be doing only humanities subjects, some only, only science. And that's fine. I wouldn't blame anyone for, for choosing English, history and French. Fabulous subjects. But, but tell me, because after working with these young people for a while, you know, you can spot, you know, who are the really bright ones who could have done anything at sixth form. You know they could and they know they could. So you tell me, just tell me why you didn't do physics or biology or mathematics you could have done. Now, when you ask that question of the really bright kids who are criticising and on everything you're saying and tearing it apart and, you know, they're thinking about it, they don't say because it's not my favourite subject or because I wasn't that good at that. They say this. They say, because I couldn't see any room for my creativity, or perhaps they'll use the word imagination, in science. And that's a knife, hot knife goes through me, and I think, what have we done in our education system to describe both in our public media, our commons, and in our education, that science is something to do with learning facts, established body of knowledge, and there's nothing imaginatory or exploratory about it, because those of you who are scientists who will uh, of experiences a bit. Well, look, our job is to reimagine the universe. You cannot deduce the structure of atoms or the behavior of black holes. You can't read that off the instruments. The work of a scientist is the work of a huge, centuries long work of human imagination. So, why have we got lost on this? So, um, uh, you know, I decided I'd start a project and it turned into a book and I discovered some things on the way which really surprised me. And so I'll tell you, that we won't have time, fortunately, for the whole story. I want to leave a good 35 minutes, 40 minutes to the end for, to have a proper discussion. But I'll, I'll tell you some of the things that I learned. Um, it'll answer 
it'll ask more questions than it asks, but that's good. And it'll give you a little bit of a flavor. Um, and if you want to know the gory details, of course, you can always do the Amazon thing or buy the book. Now, so one thing I discovered, of course, that this touches on uh, a subject which I know is close to your heart or a metaphor, which is close to your heart in this liberal arts program, the metaphor of the, of the, of, of, of the two cultures. So a shadow lies across all debates about where creativity lies and does it lie or not in the sciences. Is it the province of the arts? Have you noticed, by the way, that our language has been changing the last few years, that, that we started to call some subjects the creative subjects? Have you also noticed in the last very few years that people have, organisations have started identifying particular class or even jobs in their staff as creatives? <sighs> Dangerous. Don't like it. Anyway, but this is all, it's all, all it's CP Snow, it's the two cultures all over again. Um, I don't need to read you that passage, it's famous, I'm sure you've all read the Wreath Lectures and, and his book. He complained that our country is ruled by people who've gone to um, Winchester and Balliol, even then, oh my goodness, and um, uh, PPE, and you know, if you don't know Shakespeare, you're not cultured, you're anathema, but if you don't know the second law of thermodynamics, which is just as important cultural gift of scholarship in our, our times, then who cares? Right? That, was, that was the 20th century shadow. But of course, there's a 19th century shadow as well. Now, I love the romantic poets as, as, uh, as well as anyone in this room, I expect, but they have uh, an ambiguous relationship with the developing discourse around science. I'm sure you'll know William Wordsworth has some very interesting things to say that we'll come across later, I think. But, um, but John Keats, a medic, a medic, he's a trained doctor, in this long poem, Lamia, I won't ask how many of you have read the whole of the long poem, Lamia, um, but I'm sure many of you will know this short, most famous excerpt from it. It's where he called science cold. Philosophy is called natural philosophy, it's science. And Keats's message, which is the simi uh, similar to that of Edgar Allan Poe, is that science, uh, it, it extracts the wonder, the mystery, the question, the delight out of the world. We once had a rainbow, a wonderful rainbow, an awful rainbow that um, we knew her texture, but now philosophy has unwoven this rainbow. It clips an angel's wings, conquers the mysteries, it, it uh, despiritualizes the world. You see, the, so the, this imaginative, musy matter on which poets, artists um, thrive is, is, is somehow vacuumed away by science. They are, they are the, um, to those of you who are lover of the Harry Potter books or films, science is for Keats, the, dement, the great dementor of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of the world. They suck all the happiness out of it. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, but this goes back further than 18th century shadow. So even in the cradle of early modernism, Something is going on. Now, Blake happens to be my favourite poet. I don't know why, just, just, you, know, you just know this, don't you? I just adore Blake and, and his pictures. Um, uh, but he, he wasn't a friend of Newton, Locke, logic, positivism, rationality at all. And it's Blake, this is the earliest, earliest attestation I can find to this opposition of natural and, and other philosophy and creation. My business says Blake, is not to reason compare my business to create. And here's Blake drawing Newton, uh, oblivious of the wonder of the world around him. You, you may know this is the, this is the engraving which uh, gives rise um, to the, the, the sculpture, the modern sculpture outside the British Library on Marylebone Road, many, many of you will, 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 will know it. Um, but Blake by, by, depicts Newton, I don't know where you re he realised he he's at the bottom of the sea here. He's not even in the, in the air. I do a bit of scuba diving, my, and, and, and I don't know how Blake knew this, but this really does look very much like a, 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 an, an enemy encrusted rock. And yet, so, as is a bit grim, isn't it? You're looking a bit sad, and I'm feeling a bit sad now. But there, there are other stories. There, there's a, there are other voices that, that can, can take us throughout those, those, uh, those times. Isn't it? Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is a very interesting person, of course. She's uh, daughter of Lord Byron. Uh, and she wrote poetry herself. 
interesting, as, and of course was a wonderful mathematician, worked with Charles Babbage uh, on, on the mathematics behind early, early computing. She, in her biographical writings, she says that when she wanted to get herself into a state of mind to write poetry, the best personal practice was to spend a week doing mathematics first. Uh, and then she describes, um, describes how imagination works in science. Look, the wings of imagination. Those who've learnt to walk on the threshold of unknown worlds, by means of that are commonly termed par excellence the exact sciences. Now, the missed a trick. So I got York to give, call my new chair natural philosophy. I, if only I'd come across this quotation by Lovelace first. I'd have gotten to call me the chair of those who walk on the threshold of the unknown worlds. Much more romantic, right? In our own times, I'm sure many of you will know this guy, old geezer, uh, Richard Feynman, um, one of my favourite physicists, although not in every dimension, I have to say, but still, he, he's an extraordinary imaginative, imaginative pillar of 20th century science. And he, in his autobiographies, in fact, in, in the Horizon programme, which is um, one of the BBC iPlayer archives, they have about 10 programmes, which are the best science programmes of all time. Feynman talking to camera, head to camera, one frame, 50 minutes, it's a fantastic program. He talks about this discussion he had with an artist. He says, you scientists, you just, you know, you explain everything and there's, a, a, there's no wonder left. And Feynman responds, says, I'm not sure this is true. He says, I may not appreciate the aesthetics of a flower to as high a degree as you, my artist friend, but I think I see it beautiful. I can think I can detect the beauty in a flower or a sunset. But when I look at a flower, I don't just consider the petals. I think about the cells and the structure of the lipid membranes, the mechanics of the cell, the nucleus, the DNA that codes for the structure of the cells. I see beauty and structure at many different scales inside this object. So I don't understand why you think that my science subtracts from your objects of wonder and my sources of wonder in the world. I only see that it adds. Um, we'd better ask Einstein sooner or later. And Einstein this said this about imagination, like most things Einstein said, if any of you can tell me what he meant, I'd be ever so grateful, but he's obviously keen on imagination, as opposed to knowledge. So, okay, we visited a few ancient sources there. We've got two very different narratives around creativity, the imagination, science, and loosely the arts. Let's talk about some people who practice this today. Let's meet a few. So one of them is this man, this man is Ken Hay. So um, when I was at Leeds, uh, in fact, uh, if I was professor at Leeds many years, Ken Hay was um, a professor of fine art. I think he still is there. And one of the nice things about the Leeds history and fine art department is that all the professors are artists themselves and Ken is a mixed media artist and I, I remember early in my days there sitting down with him in the senior com room, um, never mind about the drawing on the right, just that's Ken, that's, he doesn't look like that anymore but he did then and I, I asked him, well, I, I said I'd really be interested to know as a scientist how you as an artist go about your projects, I mean how do you start? How do, how do you, where do the ideas come from? How do you set yourself goals? How do you then proceed? Tell me a story, tell me a story. And so Ken told me a story of a recent art project of his, which is called uh, uh, Stalingrad. And he had some, um, what he was trying to do um, was to, uh, he had some uh, grainy photographs taken at the appalling Eastern Front um, Second World War Battle of Stalingrad, where soldiers on both sides were freezing to death and starving. And was, but they were very poor photographs and it was hard to, hard to, he wanted to add to the photograph, he wanted to paint what he called backgrounds to, to history um, that, would, that would help viewers' eyes settle on the photograph, help them see more of the suffering and the pointlessness rather than just think, well, that's a bad photograph. Um, so he explained, that's, that was his, okay, that's a really lovely idea. I see where that idea comes from, I see. Um, and he said, I had an idea and I thought about the sort of colour scheme and the patterns that would work and I, so I set to and I tried it out and it didn't work. Oh, it's interesting, it didn't work. I thought, anything you tried in art work, no. Very naive, those days I was very naive. And so he, taught, he told me about this series of hypotheses, an experimental hypothesis testing in the studio, 
that's my language for it, but it, it's appropriate language. And after a few minutes, I said, well, Ken, you know, it's this, and he sort of, you know, eventually I, he said he found, he had to displace the symmetry. So he eventually found the color scheme. This is, these don't do justice at all, but you see, he put the photographs off to one, to one side and the eye is continuously drawn. It does have a rest from the photograph, but the colors bring it back and this blood red field of poppies bring you back. And there are others that, that bring the eye in diff different directions. And so I said, look, you know, the, you're, um, I could transpose some of the language into a science project and much of it would map, much of it would map. But we're not very good at telling our stories. We're very good at giving you the final polished account, but not very good at, at, at the narrative with the twists and, and tails. So I told a story, that's what the diagram on the right is, and some of you will will recognize this as a soft matter cartoon. I worked for many years on the, uh, here, so here's the soft matter bit, okay, here we go. on the problem of sticky fluids, fluids whose molecular composition was molecular strings, we call them polymers or macromolecules, and they tangle together like, like a bowl of noodles or spaghetti at the microscopic scale, and there are properties that emerge from this, and, but you imagine this, the, the cartoon on the top is this horrendously complicated system. How could you do physics with such a complicated system? Then a few people, Dejan and Doy and Edwards in the uh, 70s, 60s and 70s had this idea that by focusing on what it is like to be an individual polymer, what are the constraints on one string, um, the rest of this complex surrounding of many stringy bodies can be replaced uh, very appropriately by a sort of tube that hems you in by, because you, you can easily snake along your length. That's how we eat spaghetti politely, right? But you can't move sideways, you're in a tube. And this, you can do the mathematics with this and so develop it. And there's a, but there's a story with many, many twists and tails. So we actually mounted an exhibition, exhibition uh, uh, on these parallel stories that no one came to, but we had great fun uh, mounting it in Leeds at the British Association of the Advancement of Science. But that started me on a series of conversations. So what I wanted to do was to, was to ask so here's the project. I spent three or four years going to scientists, mathematicians, biologists, engineers, and asking them, tell me the story. Where do your, and asking myself, where do your ideas come from? Uh, how do you bring, how do you create the new? Uh, tell me the full starts. Tell me the, the, the frustrations as well as the, tell me the wrong turnings as well as the right turnings. And then, because I believe in proper control experiments, I kept on asking artists and musicians and poets and writers about their story of creativity as well. Um, and the book that I said to OUP I would write has a series of chapters on all the nice science and mathematics stories about how scientists think and where creativity comes from, a series of chapters on how musicians and artists and poets write, and a lovely undergraduate essay as a final chapter that sort of bridges between the two. And the other thing you just discover when you write books is sometimes the book, in fact, when you do anything creative, the object itself talks back to you. And the book said, I can't, you can't write me. That's not how the world is. And the stories don't, don't divide that way. So I'm now going to give you the top level summary of what I discovered in two slides. And one's a synchronic slide and one's a diachronic slide. And here's a synchronic slide that I think there are, you can divide modes of creative or imaginative thinking, but those modes don't divide between the arts, humanities and the sciences. They divide in different ways and their modalities cross between what we now term the arts and humanities. And there are I think there are many ways of dividing it. My scheme has three. It, it's got disadvantages. It doesn't work entirely well, but it works okay. So I'll tell you what they are. One is the visual. So obviously, you know, visual artists think visually. They think visually because they, they then have to create visually. But many scientists and a good many mathematicians think visually as well, far more than they think theoretically or with symbols or anything like that. Not all, some just think with symbols. It turns out, it's interesting. But you have to get under their skin to, to find this out. And visual thinking, and because visual thinking is also a metaphor for the creation, our innate creation of understanding. What do we say all the time when uh, we first understood something? Oh, I see. It's the archetypal sensory metaphor. And it turns out that as a metaphor, it has a slightly prickly history in phenomenological uh, philosophy as well. Anyway, uh, so that's visual. However, some people actually think in language and words. 
not everyone. There was, there has been from time to time a big battle over whether you, you know, Wittgenstein was involved in this. So do, do you have to have language in order to think? The answer, by the way, is no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> you can argue with me later. Uh, yeah, OK, some of you are going to argue with me later. Uh, no, sorry, you don't. Um, but, um, uh, but some people do. The point is, some people really do think with language. Or some people have modes of thinking. Now, uh, there, there's a, uh, the poets and novelists, clearly. But it turns out that there is a fascinating and surprising entangled story between the novel and fictional writing and experimental method in science. And that was interesting. I'm, we've got some time. I'll tell you briefly about that story because it gives you an example of digging down deeper into the, the project. And then there's a third mode of, of, uh, of, of creative thinking, which is itself a bit of a surprise because you'd have thought that if, I, if I'm in a place where there's nothing to see and nothing to write, there's no words, there's no pictures, then, then what do I have to work with to create or imagine? And the answer is this is where the abstract transcendent spaces of music and mathematics live. And I unapologetically have an apophatic approach, a negative, via negativa, to music and mathematics. Far too much has been said far too glibly about the obvious links between music and mathematics. I don't think there are. Is anything obvious to say about music and mathematics? You know, Jessica's a really good clarinet pl player. She's obviously going to be brilliant at mathematics. Well, why? You know, you hear it all the time, right? But, um, but I think there is something going on, and I'll say something about that. Right, that's a synchronic uh, little picture, and um, we, we'll, we'll have time to say a little bit more about those. Well, I don't have time to say more other than the, than the overview is the diachronic um, story, which I've hinted at before. It's the, it's the narrative. It's Ken's story. It's my story. Ken's story about Stalingrad art. It's my story about the, the sticky polymers. It's, it's, I've heard this story so many times in so many different ways. I'm not saying that everyone's story of bringing the new idea to fruition is the same. But when you've collected them all, you see a pattern and it goes something like this. For some reason or other, you have an initial idea, you have a vision, but it's a misty vision of something you want to do. It could be a piece of physics, it could be a theorem in mathematics, it could be a string quartet, it could be a poem about a flower or a black hole, it could be, all, it could be a play, it could be anything. You know, it could be organising a family holiday. I don't want to be sort of, uh, you know, particularly academic and snobby about this. Uh, you know, creating things that don't exist and solving problems in order to bring that new thing about. Uh, all sorts of people do it in all sorts of everyday uh, circumstances as well. But the point is, it's an, it's an unclear vision. If it were clear, you'd have solved the problem. But the first, the next thing that happens is you, is the idea itself, the sight, the mental sight elicits a desire. It is its emotional energy. You really want to do this. You really want that PhD, which is a good thing when you think about it. Because if you didn't really want to, we would all give up in year two, right? Uh, if we didn't have this emotional dis desire uh, to get to the end point and, 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 and solve our problem or produce our result. So notice one thing straight away. This is another leitmotif which has come from the stories. Whether they were mathematicians, physicists, playwrights or whoever. One could not tease, if it were the cognitive, from the emotional, the thought from the affect. Everyone's story of creativity brings emotion and affect and cognition together. And you cannot tease them apart. It, there, it, there's an emotive energy which drives all creative acts. And the mathematicians, you might think the pure mathematicians, are, are the most emotional about this. And by the way, if you want a proof of this, go back to BBC iPlayer, go back to the Horizon program archive and pull out the, um, pull out the one on uh, Femme as last Simon Sings, who uh, later became a book, produced this lovely piece with Andrew Wiles, who solved Femme as last theorem. And it opens with, just like Femme as Andrew Wiles, straight to camera, just talking for the, I know, 250th time about the moment where he finally, under public exposure, having published a fallacious proof after working in silence at Princeton, undercover for seven years to solve this one thing. Couldn't do it here, could you, ref, and all that. Um, and uh, he, the morning he saw 
the most beautiful mathematical connection, deep line which would allow him to solve it, and he still cannot finish the sentence because he breaks down into it. Because he's, it's that, just the memory of it. Uh, uh, and so this is, you know, this is a, a, a Cambridge, Princeton, pure mathematician. So there we go. Um, there's a series of attempts to create it, and you know, the weightlifting guinea pig says it all really. You, you, it, it, it is hard to do. No one's done this stuff before. This is new, and most of it fails over and over again because you bash against constraints like Ken did, I did, the complications, it doesn't agree with the data. And then, so very often you give up. And you give up, maybe giving up is the right thing to do, at least temporarily. You have a rest, you go on to something else for a few hours, days, weeks, months even. Um, you go for a walk in the mountains and, and then, you know, if you're lucky, it's, it doesn't always happen quickly. Uh, it sometimes happens very slowly, but sometimes there are these aha moments. If I had a fiver for everyone who said, and it, I was getting off a bus when, in, it's extraordinary. It really happens a lot. People get off walk through doors and they have an idea that they've been searched that arrives at if effortlessly but you realize that you wouldn't have had this effort as this oh yeah I'll try that this is why people talk of the muse it's as if someone whispered in your ear but of course it's not that what's actually going on is that the subconscious area of our brains that we we are which are not aware are are actually very creative places they're working on stuff all the time and we do hard work to input to those places um, and those moments where uh, creative nuclei of ideas surface from those depths are very rare and I have a theory for why by the way you get them coming off buses but I won't tell you yet. Um, Amateur psychology, you be an amateur, you know, interdisciplinary stuff, it's very bad for you, you end up being an amateur of everything, which is terrible. Um, and then, of course, there's a final aesthetic emotional response to this, a great joy and a final uh, 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 emotional response to the end. So, so there's this weaving of emotion, which we should be much more honest about. In fact, uh, the, uh, proof of the pudding here is, is one of the chapters for the book, the one I'm, I'm about to tell you about in the section after next, about the, 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 the novel and uh, experimental science, I wrote as a visiting fellow to the Institute of Advanced Studies at University of Notre Dame. And it's, if you've ever been, if you get a chance to be a fellow at an IES, do. It's, it's just great. You're, you can work on whatever you want to, and there's only one of you. So there was one physicist, and there was a theologian, there was a film studies um, theorist, there was a, a, a medieval art historian, there was a, 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 a equestrian historian, I mean, it's a, a, a great mix. And the only rules are you have to go to each other's seminars twice a week and engage in the discussion after that, you can do what you like. So, uh, and there was a historian um, whose name was Patrick, who I was really looking forward to hearing uh, my seminar. So I just got to the point where I'd, I'd, I'd got this, this story, I'd, this, I'd extracted this pattern. Um, and I wanted to just present this as, as a framework uh, on which to hang to ask, would, can you hang scientific creative, mathematical creativity, artistic creativity on this story? And I told the story, and then uh, we had a nice discussion, but Patrick didn't say anything at all. Um, and I was, I was desperately disappointed, not in him, but in me. I thought, um, this is all illusory. Uh, I've failed completely. If I can't get a question out of him, he always asks a good question, I fail to communicate or he's being polite, I know I'm doing something completely trivial, um, you know, imposter syndrome breaks out all over in hives and, and so I go home miserable. The next morning is a knock on my little office door, it's open, it knocks anyway and there's Patrick. Oh, hi Patrick, hi Tom. Um, just wanted to say uh, thank you for your seminar yesterday. Oh, oh, okay good, thank you. And sorry I didn't ask a question. Oh. Um, but you made me think and reflect so hard by what you said. I, 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 was, in, I was in some degree of, sort of mental turbulence. Um, oh my goodness, <laughs> because you told me the story of my life as an academic historian, as if you knew what it was like to be an academic historian, which you obviously don't because you, well, not directly because you aren't one. You're a physicist, that's right, Patrick. Um, no, but he said, I've, uh, he said, when I, 
when, when I get, it was the stuff I said about the threading of the emotions up and down, the positive and the negatives with the cognitive effect. He said, when I, when I, um, my history, I can explain something, when it's all fitting, when my theory, I get so excited um, and I get very, very high. But when I cannot make sense of my data, when none of my models work, when I'm, I, I get very, very low, he said, I've, I've honestly thought that I might be bipolar. Um, but hey, you've told me it's just life. So I thought to myself, well, if this piece, if this, if this project has kept one academic, uh, academic off, American off Prozac, then my job is done here. Um, but 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 how? It just told me how we're so shy about this. We don't tell each other our stories of academic creativity. And this is a humanities scholar talking about. Of course, academic history is is creative. Right, so there's a creation narrative, and I don't have time to tell you any more stories about the story, because I've got a little bit of time to tell you a bit about those three categories, and then we're done, right? So a bit more about the visual. Einstein, again, is an example of a theoretical physicist who thought visually. His maths comes to him, he says, very, very painfully, after he's thought visually. And, and um, I wanted to write about uh, Impressionism. Not only because <laughs> I love Monet, well, who doesn't? I, I, it's very dull to love Monet, but I just do. Um, but I, 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 the reason that I, re I, after reading the art critic Clement Greenberg, I realised why, as a theoretical physicist, I liked Impressionist so much. And it's when I read the thing, the thing that he says about what was really new about what Monet and, and his contemporaries were doing was that they were making the canvas an object worthy of an artistic inspection in its own right as well as being representative of the world beyond. And I thought, aha, that's why I love this. Because as a theoretical physicist, the, the double vision one has to have in one's work at the, at the same time is to be aware that the model you're building is not the world. It's the canvas that you're painting a working mathematical model of the world. And the, and the connection is is perhaps tenuous at times, tighter at others. But the information on the world can be represented, it can be implied, like this lovely sunset. You know that the sun's setting, you can't see the sun. But look at how the pine trees are underlit with this fiery russet. And you know the sun is setting on the horizon, on the right, you know it's red, and you know the top of the sun is yellow because of it's light on the glass, you know much more. And I can't, this of course is a terrible reproduction, but when you're in the Philadelphia Museum of Art in front of this picture, those trees move in the breeze. Think I'm kidding? Well, let's think about vision. Plato thought that vision was not to do, as we think, with rays of light coming into the eye from outside. Plato thought that we cast vision rays onto objects deliberately. So how come you can't see in a dark room then, Plato? Well, he, he really, he thought about that. He knew that one had to be light around, but it's still, and it's in our language now, we cast, we cast glances around, I'm looking at you. And of course, one of the big objections to the intramissive theory of vision is, that, is the confusion. If, if it were true, that your eyes were receiving light from every possible, every place and location in your field of view. All you'd get is a confused mess. You'd never be able to see any object out. So there's um, Plato. If you don't believe me, um, yeah, now this is Asherti Katoka's Rotating Snakes. Who sees, who sees motion? Put your hand up if you see a bit of motion there. Great, not everyone. Who sees, who doesn't see anything moving? Always one or two. It's not your fault, I mean, it's all wanted interesting. You don't see anything moving, no. But everyone else sees a little rotation here. Now, the people who see rotation... Yeah, yeah, so don't look. Do you want me to move on? Whoa, okay, let me move on. Let me move on. Um, sorry about this, I'll move back for a moment. Um, there is no rotation. Of course, you, you, some of you will think it's a moving GIF, but they're, they're very, very interesting illusions. Uh, there is no motion in that picture. You are inter your brain is projecting motion onto the picture. I just wanted to convince you that extra mission is right, or at least half right. When you consider the whole perceptual train, we are psychologically 
and missing projecting interpret possible interpretations of our, of our uh, visual world as much as we are meeting with incoming rays halfway. So that's why vision is such a suitable metaphor for imaginative creativity because half of it is imagined. Anyway, you ask any police officer who interviews people's vis what they saw, right, at an incident. We know that, I'm sorry, I'm going to go briefly through that. Close your eyes, on we go. Um, so, I'm a, so visual stories, here's the first, my own visual story. I now work on the soft matter of biology and here's a, I remember a sort of slight daydream which led to a 10 year research project. So I remember seeing at a lecture this, which is a, a, a biological diagram of a, uh, of a protein binding to DNA. You can see the double helix of the short section of DNA. You can see a ribbon diagram of a, of a protein. And, um, but one of the, one of the gifts that I think physics can bring to biology, this is another talk here, is that, um, is that biology, for good reasons, but partially has developed over the 20th century, particularly, a mantra that structure gives function. And of course it comes from Crick and Watson and the structure of DNA and, and Max Perutz and structure of proteins and all that, but any soft matter physicist knows that at the nanoscale, Matter isn't like that. Matter's like this. All structure is compromised the entire time by this seething, chaotic, thermal motion we call heat. It's called Brownian motion, right? And I remember what I, quote, saw extromissively when I intromissively saw that 15 years ago at a graduate seminar is this. Now, this later was um, concretized in, a, this is actually a simulation done by David Burns in the chemistry department at Durham later of this same protein at room temperature and it is indeed seething about. But this idea of how this noisy environment could, could sustain propagation of information transfer rather than interrupt it um, was a source of visual imaginative energy to me. And I suppose let's go back to Einstein. Um, I mean I suppose one of the most beautiful gifts, cultural gifts of the 20th century. I wouldn't have gone with C.P. Snow for second law of thermodynamics. I'd have gone for Einstein's general relativity. I'd gone for gravity is curvature, gravity is geometry. Anyone can understand curvature and round things and curved things and pits and, and, and the fact that, that we, can, we can think of this common <laughs> uh, captivating force of gravity as the curvature of space and time is I think just a beautiful gift and of course entirely, entirely, entirely visual. Now it turns out that this, um, some of you who at my earlier lecture today would have already met him. This is uh, Robert Grosstest, um, the most influential scientist you've never heard of. Some of you have heard of him. He wrote about comets and light and colour and sound and uh, rainbows in the 1220s in the most extraordinary way, and this is uh, another, it was another talk that has set an interdisciplinary team of medieval scholars and scientists off um, using medieval natural philosophy as a source for ideation in science today. Great surprise for us, we never expected that, but it's happened. Anyway, let me tell you what he says in his commentary to Aristotle's scientific method. He, he uses an untranslatable word, it's solertia, is James of Venice's translation of, Arist of Aristotle's Greek, which is really the scientific imagination or the mind's eye, is the penetrating power, uh, let's read it, a virtue of which the mind's eye does not rest on the outer surface of an object, but penetrates to something below the visual image. For instance, when the mind's eye falls on a coloured surface, it does not rest there, but descends to the physical structure of which the colour is an effect. It then penetrates this structure until it detects the elemental qualities of which the structure is itself an effect. Now, I don't think I'm being presentist to say that Grosstest prefigures Feynman in what he says here. This is the human imagination confronting matter and refusing to be satisfied with the superficial. And this is another thing. This is another reason I love science. I love science because <laughs> it refuses to be satisfied with a glance on the surface of the world, but engages the powers of imagination because what else can do this other than the tech, oh, well, what else can do it is the technology and technique and art. Yes, of course, and microscopy and neutron scattering, all that. But that only is, is driven by imagination to see beneath the structure of uh, matter. Now, by the way, I mentioned a few that you can get all philosophy here. It's Emmanuel Levinas, postmodern philosopher, uh, interests me very much. Um, 
has a, a strong, mounts a strong critique of the visual metaphor, which he says is imperialistic and distancing. He prefers the auditory metaphor for imagination. Um, the sound is like the sense of quality overflowing. It limits the incapacity to form and hold its, con its, its content. Vision, he says, is imperialistic. I, um, I've learned recently that Nietzsche wrote about the sense of smell as an appropriate uh, metaphor for, uh, for ideation. But there, there we go. So, so there's a little, little bit of visual story. To, uh, that whets your appetite. I'm going to go on for another five minutes. Is that okay? That would be 45 if I do that. Right. Um, I have to tell you the story about the textual, and then we'll briefly look at the abstract. Uh, okay, I claim that uh, that the scientific method and the fictional writing are siblings or perhaps cousins. Um, well, uh, let's see um, if there might be evidence for that. Let's ask Joe Priestley. Uh, Oxygen, that one. Uh, works of fiction, he says, resemble those machines which contrive to illustrate the Fincel's philosophy, such as globes and orreries. He says that without explanation in that lecture, as if it were obvious. Um, now, take this to our own times, take Iris Murdoch, great philosopher of our, our own times, writing about the novel. Novelistic writing enables attention to the inexhaustible detail of the world, the endlessness of the task of understanding, and the appreciation of the unique. Substitute novelistic writing for experimental science and run past that sentence in your mind again. Now, I have a huge debt of gratitude here to Pat War, a professor of English at Durham, who said to me again at the beginning of this project, Tom, you do realise, don't you, that the coincidental historical origin of the early English novel and experimental method is not a coincidence. Robinson Crusoe and Robert Boyle's vacuum pump have things in common. Well, that's interesting. What, what is going on here? And part of what's going on here is, is actually apophatic. Again, so the thing about the experimental method, I've come very late in life to realise, is that it is just not obvious that it should work. Now, this is why it's so unfair to criticise the pre-moderns or the medievals we talked about this afternoon, of not looking at medieval science through the wrong end of the telescope. Um, as if they were stupid. Why didn't they use experimental method? Well, they were developing it hard, but if you think about it, the world is a complex, chaotic, myriad component, unpredictable place. You're telling me that if I put one salt and one metal in a little glass test tube, I will learn something about that world? Go on. Uh, uh, that's how I summarise the argument in non-philosophical terms. But you see, uh, experiment is something very artificial and very simplified. Um, and the best crit crit critique of experimental method in the early, uh, 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 early modern period in this country is Margaret Cavendish. Margaret Cavendish, first woman to attend a meeting of the Royal Society. She's an absolute ace natural philosopher, and she also genders this wonderfully. She basically says these experiments are toys for the boys. Um, you know, they're simple-minded, poor things. They need these things, but we girls can, can, can cope with, 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 um, with, with the proper philosophy of complexity. Uh, and, and she, but, uh, she writes that in her philosophical writings, notes on experimental philosophy, but she also writes a novel arguably the first science fiction novel, it's called Blazing Worlds. Blazing Worlds is another world which you get to by going to the North Pole and then you can ride up on this other world, Philip Pullman. Uh, uh, and the, the scientists and all the, the beings have animal heads and the scientists, they have telescopes and they have instruments, but their instruments only serve to make their arguments worse. They don't resolve any disputes and she engages novelistically in, um, in, in uh, this argument, but in the literature itself, if you compare, um, let's uh, 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 what Daniel Defoe says about science and what Robert Boyle says about, about the world. Rob Boyle is talking about the world's a great book, a book which up till that point had been read, but which I think what's one of the things that's going on in early modern science is that the nature as a great book motif is being turned into something we can write on. Uh, there we go. Um, Daniel Defoe, writing about science. Uh, 
should be a public blessing to all mankind. He, both he and Boyle, by the way, were, would have been very excited to see citizen science projects. And look, can you see what's going on here? If you, if you have the imaginative so chutzpah to, to think of writing a story about one man being shipwrecked on a little island with a few sheep, he's given a few guns, a little bit of ammunition left over, and let's stand back and see what happens. Can you see how there's a zeitgeist about artificial and simple situations from which we can learn that span the novel and early modern science. And again, if you want to further evidence, we won't go into details here, but if you compare, for example, um, Henry James's uh, collection of prefaces of his novels called The Art of the Novel, where he talks about the stages of writing a novel, that actually, I, I, told you, I said I wouldn't go back to the story, I lie. Here's the, the story comes out again. I won't go through the quotes here, but ideation, observation, that's incubation of ideas, that's when you can't do it. Um, illumination, that's the aha moment, verification, that's the series of work at the end. Move on a generation, physiologist called William Beveridge, and I don't necessarily agree with everything he writes, but the fact that he writes a book called The Art of Scientific Investigation is really interesting. He's deliberately patterning it on James, who deliberately patterns it on Horace, Ars Poetica, it's the art, the art of, and uses exactly the same, the same language. So um, let's, let's, let's skip over Humboldt and indeed, uh, pa uh, uh, and indeed Pat War and um, uh, Virginia Woolf, The Lighthouse. But, but you know, there's lots of, lots of gorgeous 19th and 20th century examples. We'll just quickly visit the third mode and then we're done, the abstract. And um, it turns out there is a, a great treasure trove of reflection, particularly French mathematicians, reflect on the mathematical process. Henri Poincaré um, and Adamar as well, uh, uh, but, uh, towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century, reflect on where mathematical ideas come from. And they even do mathematics about this subject. And Poincaré thought that this subconscious world that we mentioned was, was sorting out the fruitful from the unfruitful ideas for us before the aha moment. He, he, he thought maybe all it does is just to blindly uh, go through different um, combinations of ideas. He very quickly realised that all combinatorics give you hyper astronomical numbers that no computing machine or thinking machine could ever um, uh, routinely list and exhaust and therefore our subconscious mind must also be directed by some sort of aesthetics. All right. uh, George Steiner talks of the allegory of mathematics which is music and, and uh, but the, in terms of connecting mathematics and, and musical ideas which are also somehow transcendent you can't picture them you can't um, about my, my, my most profound insight as far as I've got I don't think I've solved this problem came from Julian Horton so, so in, in the same way that, that the Monet was my favourite Monet and I talked to the had a, a morning with the European curator at the Philadelphia um, Museum my favourite composer is no uh, apologies for this Robert Schumann great year for Robert and Clara uh, last year, um, and I just adore Schumann's music, totally underrated, uh, and also I'm a very, very amateur French horn player. Um, now Schumann was, I should explain, not just a, a creator of music, he was a creator of whole genres of music. He invented the piano quintet, by the way, there's no piano quintets before Schumann's and it's the best ever, right? So, uh, he all, some of his genres didn't catch on, but there's one genre that should have caught on, but no one else could write for it. Concerto for four horns and orchestra. It's fantastic. If you don't believe me, Concert Schuch for four horns orchestra, YouTube has several great recordings. Go and 15 minutes of your life will not be uh, 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 better spent um, before bedtime this evening. And it doesn't exist, the, there's no analysis of it. So I really wanted to talk about this piece of music, but I, um, Julian Horton was a music college at Durham. I said, well, actually, Tom, uh, I have a project on 19th century symphonic music going on now. Why don't we both sit down together for a few afternoons and do the analysis? So I saw a musicologist at work. That was fascinating, looking at the keys and things. At one point, Julian leans back and he says, you know, it caused me to think about this. What distinguishes composers of the first rank is their ability to set up strategic problems of harmony and to solve them within the aesthetic project of the piece of music. That is interesting because the way mathematicians prove theorems, you see, the theorems themselves are given or not, but the proofs are imagined and created 
and you never get to the whole proof in one go, you just create the next sub-problem for you. It's like which, which of these mountain passes would be the one that would take me to my goal? Uh, so there's something going on there. Um, of course, other things that go on there is that both musicians and mathematicians use funny dots. Now they say that for every equation you cut your sales of your book by half. Uh, I don't know if that goes with musical staves as well, but I'm saying, look, 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 look. It doesn't matter if you can't read this stuff. I have to give you examples because these are the symbols by which symbolic innovators work. Um, and, and some people look at that and say, oh, that's the, you know, oh, that's clever. And some people see the four horse. You know, so you know, some people can hear that and, and see this. This is diffusion of particles and that's, that's, that, that's, that, that's four horns playing. Um, uh, there are similarities as well. So I'm asking far more questions in mathematics and music than I'm answering. Now, time is time to stop. So I'm not going to talk about thought and feeling. Um, I'm going to leave us with the title of the book. Shakespeare. And poetry. Why is poetry? <laughs> um, so, so one person, <laughs> well, several people. So I've just had a, 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 a lovely thing happen. There's a, a whole issue of interdisciplinary science reviews, which is a journal being devoted to the book, which is I'm on the editorial board. But seven of the other editors are writing reviews and I'm responding to them. Um, and it's going to make a really nice academic discussion about interdisciplinarity and in art and poetry and science, I hope. I'll give you a link for later on if you want to, to when it's out. But several of them have said, um, ahem, uh, Trade Descriptions Act, you didn't talk about poetry. And it's true, there isn't a chapter on poetry. But the reason that I say the poetry of science is because, it's because of two things. It's because of, of the way poets work is to, it's the meeting, isn't it? It's the meeting of imaginative energy and conception, which on its own, uncontrolled and unformed would, would leave a puddle of prose on the floor. But that imaginative energy is, is met with the confines and constraints of form. And constraint, as every artist and every scientist knows, constraints are never destructive. Constraints are constructive. Constraints are beautiful. Constraints are half the answer. Why do you write a sonnet? Because you're so much in love, it, you'd just be a mess if all your words and emotions, you write a sonnet when you're deeply in love, because I'm sure you will do, because, because, because that's the, that's the straitjacket which will turn and sculpt your energies into something beautiful that actually says something. Now, what could constitute greater imaginative energy than the demand to reimagine the universe? And what could constitute a tighter form than to make that imagination conform to the universe that we observe? Which is why when Shakespeare gives Theseus these words, when the lovers return in uh, at five, Midsummer Night's Dream, everyone is, is paired with their right pair. So imagination bodies forth and turns the forms of these things unknown by the poet's pen giving to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And I think that that's what science does. At that point, I will thank you for listening to me babbling away so far and stop and hear you say much more sensible things. Thank you. <laughs>